I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Revelation 3, 7 through 13. As we continue our series, Dear Church, to these seven letters, to the seven churches in Revelation, and we're to the sixth letter. And this letter is to church at Philadelphia with a message that I've entitled, An Open Door. I want to begin this morning with an equation, and it's not a mathematical equation if you don't like math as I do, so don't get freaked out. Uh, It's just an equation for life, and that equation is this, purpose plus opportunity equals potential. Purpose plus opportunity equals potential. That equation applies to every facet of life. If you think about business, when a business is met with certain opportunities. You take the purpose of business is established for, whatever that may be, it is given opportunities to produce or to provide that business that leads to the potential of that business. In our personal lives, uh, the purpose that God has created for you when met with the opportunities that God gives you to live out that purpose leads to the potential for your life to impact the world for the kingdom of God. And the same equation applies to the church. The purpose of a church is simple. It's the same for every church, whether it's in a city or in the country, whether it's a big church or a small church, whether it's a church in the U.S. or church overseas. The purpose of the church is the Great Commission. And that commission is repeated in all four of the Gospels. It's repeated again in the book of Acts. But we know it most uh, readily from Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, where Jesus says, All authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and know that I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That is the purpose of the church. And so then the Lord gives every church opportunities for pursuing that purpose. Through though locations and resources might limit a church in some ways, I believe that many churches miss far more opportunities than they seize. All you have to do is look around. Have you ever noticed that in the same area where there will be a thriving church, there will also be a dying church? So it's not location, it is something else. Every church has the same purpose. Every church has unique opportunities given to it by God to meet that purpose. And when a church's purpose meets its opportunities, you find that church's potential. I like what one pastor wrote. He said, nothing on earth has greater potential to change lives and carry out Christ's kingdom work in your community than your local church. There's nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. Do you believe that? I certainly do. That was a weak amen. But do you believe that? Good, because it's true. And that is something that we have to believe. The church is a powerful force for the Lord Jesus Christ. But not every church has as many resources as others due to the economics of its area. Not every church has the same uh, potential to grow as large as others due to its population. But there is really only one thing that reaches, that, that, Uh, sets apart a church that reaches its potential from a church that fails to meet its potential. And that one thing is faithfulness. Faithfulness in its purpose, faithfulness in seizing opportunities that God gives it. A faithful church has limitless potential. And faithfulness was a hallmark of this church in Philadelphia. This was not a church that moved with the world. This was a church that moved the world. It was a church that fulfilled its purpose. It seized its opportunity. It reached its potential. And therefore, whereas Jesus had nothing good to say to the church at Sardis, he has nothing but good to say to the church in Philadelphia. 
Philadelphia was the youngest of the seven cities addressed in Revelation. It was founded by Attalus, king of Pergamum, to uh, honor his brother whom he succeeded as king. And so that's where the name comes from, Philadelphia, the city of, we know, brotherly love. Center for spreading Greek language and culture. And so in a sense, it was missionary from the beginning to promote unity within the realm. Spiritually, the city was composed of Jews and of course pagans and then this small band of Christians. But over all of them, paganism reigned. In fact, the city of Philadelphia was known um, as Little Athens because of its many temples that were there. Philadelphia's location benefited it, not only philosophically as the, the Greek culture could spread from there, but also economically because it was on the main route from Rome to the east. It became known the, as the gateway to the east, and merchants who were traveling to and from Asia Minor had to pass through the city. But whereas the city was commercially profitable, it wasn't without trials and challenges. The city of Philadelphia was located on a major fault line and it was prone to frequent earthquakes more than any other city in that region. In fact, a disastrous earthquake had occurred in AD 17 with aftershocks that lasted for several years afterwards. And the city after that uh, earthquake was so unstable that many people lived in the countryside in tents and other dwellings because they didn't trust the dwellings in the city. But in this city, this church faithfully served. Jesus describes himself to them in a way that would give them confidence, just as he does all the other churches. Look at verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, and what he opens no one can shut, and what he shuts no one can open. As with all the letters, Jesus identifies himself at the outset, but unlike all the other letters, he doesn't pull something about himself mentioned in chapter 1 of Revelation. Instead, he offers new ideas to Revelation, but certainly not new ideas to the Bible. Jesus here says that he is holy and true. These are, of course, well-known traits of God. These titles stood in direct contrast to the polytheistic culture in which the Philadelphians lived. And Jesus claims by saying this that he is the real deal. He is holy. He is true. I want us to look at both of those words a little bit. The word holy. Some people think that uh, that word holy means that if you're holy, you walk around with a halo on your head all the time. But that is not what that word means. The word holy simply means set apart. But while it has a simple meaning, it is not a simplistic idea. Because that Jesus is holy means that he is by nature distinct from everyone and everything else. That he is holy means that he is separated from sin and he is therefore right and true in everything that he does. Most importantly, this description identifies Jesus with God. And so holiness elevates Jesus above all other gods. Every other god in the world today and that has ever been in the world is a satanic counterfeit meant to lead the masses away from the one true God. There is only one true God. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else is a satanic counterfeit. Jesus is holy because he is distinct, and because he is distinct, he is exclusive. Jesus is holy. Jesus also says he is true, or your translation may say something like trustworthy or dependable or faithful. All of those mean the same thing. He is the opposite of everything that is, is uh, false and everything that is deceitful. Man-made religions promise a lot, they require a lot, but they deliver nothing. But Jesus will do what he says he will do. 
He will never leave you. Even when you think he is absent, he is there. You cannot run away from him. You cannot be lost by him because he is true and he is faithful. Notice also then, Jesus says that he holds the keys of David. Now that quality is based on an event found in Isaiah chapter 22 where the treasurer Shebna is removed from his post and position in the king's service and among the responsibilities taken away from him is this uh, controlling of the key of David. Whoever possessed the key of David controlled access to the palace and access to the king. Whoever controlled the key then was second in command and authority only to the king. Well, Jesus says he now has the key. He is in authority. He either opens access to God or shuts access to God. He also has the power to open doors of opportunity for ministry for you and for me or for our church. And he also has the authority to close doors when we are unfaithful and no longer useful to his kingdom. Therefore, he says, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. So this is who Jesus is. He's established his authority. He's established his character for this church as a way of beginning to encourage them. And so now Jesus moves to his commendation, as he does in all of these letters in verse 8. Look what he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my names. Like he did all the others, Jesus says he knows this church's deeds. He knows this church with a personal and an accurate knowledge. He does not receive his information from messengers He walks among the churches himself. He walks among the lampstands, as we saw earlier. Jesus knows these pastors. He knows these churches through a personal and and intimate knowledge that comes from watching them every single day. It should be encouraging to us that Jesus sees everything. He sees what we do, he sees what we say, he sees where we go. Now, in some ways that might cause us some regret or some fear. But remember, Jesus is not like a traffic camera waiting for you to mess up and catch you in that. More often, all the time actually, he is like a loving parent who's watching their child play. Think about that. Put yourself in that position, parents and grandparents. You're sitting back, you're watching your kids play, and they're having a great time. You enjoy watching them enjoy life. And so you celebrate that with them. But what are you also always doing? You're always watching out for danger. And you're going to call them back. Come back. Don't go there. Wait. Stop. You're there to help. You're there to watch. You're there to protect. That is what Jesus does. And he sees everything. Now, this church, like many of the others, lived in relative obscurity. They're not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. But what a reminder these letters are that even when we are unknown by the world, God still knows us. You know, not many people outside of central Louisiana may know about a church at LeCount and a church at Pineville. Certainly not many outside of the state of Louisiana, but Jesus does. He is with us. He has a purpose for us. And he wants us to seize that purpose. Philadelphia was seizing theirs. This church had spiritual vitality. They knew their purpose and were pursuing it despite challenges. And so Jesus had absolutely no criticism whatsoever to give them. Because of their faithfulness to their purpose... Jesus was now the one who holds the keys, opening doors of opportunity for this church. Uh, The idea of an open door appears throughout the New Testament, and it always has to do with a door of opportunity, especially for preaching the gospel. We see this in the ministry of the Apostle Paul several times through Acts and and Paul's letters. We read about an open door or going through an open door, praying for an open door. We should never force doors open 
because it's pointless to do so. And that's because we are powerless to open doors God has not opened. Only God opens doors for ministry. But when He opens a door for you or for me or for our church, we need to walk through it because He has a plan for us. The church at Philadelphia had a strategic opportunity. This church in the city of brotherly love was now going to be used to reach the world with the love of Jesus. This church in a city that was intended to spread Greek culture was now going to be used to spread God culture and to spread Jesus Christ throughout the world. The same things that had made that city strategically for commercial and culture were now going to be used strategically for God's purposes spiritually. God uses what we give him. Since merchants had to pass through that city, the church had an opportunity to reach people across the empire with the gospel of Jesus Christ without ever leaving home. They could do international missions from their back doorstep. Jesus was holding the door of evangelism wide open, and the Philadelphians were walking through it every day. Many a church has seized the opportunities that Jesus has opened for them. I believe that that we have walked through several doors here at the Pineville campus that the Lord has opened before us in the years past. Like when we started the E4 preaching conference or when we started Upward Sports or when we stepped out and hired our first full-time children's minister or when we renovated our campus or when we invested in streaming or when we began Connect Camp. Most recently when we acquired and united with the LeCount campus, all of those were challenging. They were challenging to resources, they were challenging to personnel, but we saw them as doors God was opening, and so we walked through them, and God has used those to do so much more through us as a church. There will be other doors that the Lord will give us in the future, and we must walk through them as God opens them. But while open doors bring opportunities, many churches have missed opportunities that Jesus opened for them. And that's one reason some churches eventually close down. When you don't walk through the doors God opens for you, you run the risk of Him eventually closing your own doors. F.B. Meyer wrote, the church which is not a missionary church will be a missing church when Jesus comes. I suppose we think that if God opens the door, then everything will fall into place. We'll have the people, we'll have the money, we'll have all the things we need. But this letter reminds us that that's not always the case. Sometimes we stand before an open door thinking we can't. And that's precisely what God wants us to think. Because He wants to prove Himself faithful. Even in Philadelphia, in this perfectly faithful church, as far as we know, there were two challenges. First, Jesus says, notice, that they had little strength. That's not a criticism. That's just a statement of fact. It could refer to the size of the church. It could refer to the social status of its members. It could refer to their financial ability. All three of those are something else we don't even know about. But still, Jesus promised to use the key of David to open up great opportunities for service, and no one was going to be able to shut it and end those opportunities. Uh, Many of you remember Dr. Leon Hyatt. He was one of our retired minister members here. It's one of the neat benefits we have of of pastoring here. We have retired ministers and retired missionaries, and that's been a joy. Well, Dr. Hyatt would also often talk about his ministry at First Baptist Homa. That was very early in his ministry. And he was down there at the end of Louisiana in Homa. And I was always fascinated by how God opened doors for Dr. Hyatt and that church to walk through, especially in planting churches all across South Louisiana. Uh, Dr. Hyatt said, though, that when he first went to First Baptist Home, he was told that it was a church of little potential because of its location and because of the makeup of the congregation. Well, Dr. Hyatt could have believed that, but instead he listened to God and he saw open doors all the time and they walked through them. I think Dr. Hyatt believed what Warren Rearsby writes, unbelief sees the obstacles, but faith 
seize the opportunities. We want to be people who walk in faith. Little strength is not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. In fact, it can be a very good thing. When we realize our weakness, it causes us to come to the Lord in humility. That allows Him to do things in His strength because when we're weak, He is strong. A second challenge is mentioned on down in verse 9 where Jesus says, I'll make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. This indicates that there was also some Jewish opposition in this city. There was a group of Jews in Philadelphia who were a lot like the Jews in Smyrna. In fact, we should call them so-called Jews because these were not people of God. They were people of Satan. And they were doing some evil things in that area. Apparently, these Jews were persecuting these Christians in some way. Chuck Swindoll writes, he says, Open doors, even if held by the Savior himself, do not guarantee the absence of evil. We step through them to discover opportunities for service, but we also find new opportunities for selfishness and pride, defection and compromise. Evil opposition waits for spiritual progress at the threshold of every open door. And I can assure you that every time we've walked through an open door as a church, there has been some kind of opposition that has come. It waits for that. While the opposition was problematic though, Jesus knew that this church would prevail because not only did they have two weaknesses, but they also had two major strengths. Those are back in verse 8. Notice he says they had kept his word and they had not denied his name. First, they had kept his word. They maintained biblical fidelity. They were people of the book, though they didn't have the book in its total form. But they knew God's word. They lived by God's word. They have, may have been weak in terms of size or influence or finances or whatever, but they were strong in the faith. And Jesus loved that about them. And so he says they had kept his word. But he also said they had not denied his name. Even though they faced persecution, these Christians maintained a pure witness. They were unafraid to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus loved that about them too. And apparently this church was known for taking this kind of stand, for keeping God's word, and for refusing to deny his name. That was their reputation, and what a great one it was. In fact, the... the a tense of the verbs in Greek there, they had kept his word, had not denied his name, is a kind of form that means that there was some point in time in the past where a decision was made to be faithful. So there was a test, and they passed it, and they kept on passing it. They had proven faithful, and they were continuing to prove faithful. Therefore, when Jesus looked at this church, he saw a reflection of himself, and I pray that that is what Jesus sees when he looks at us. So we've seen, as in every letter, this common outline, Christ, then commendation, there's no criticism, but we do have a promise. In fact, I think Jesus offers five promises in verses 9 through 12. We've read verse 9. Let's begin at verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. What are those five promises? Well, first, Jesus will humble our enemies and he'll open their eyes to the truth. Back in verse 9, Jesus talks about these so-called Jews who brought about things, and, and there's probably a hyphen towards the end of verse 9. He says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. In the end, persecution will end, and the conditions will be reversed. Those in the synagogue of Satan who were persecuting these people will be raised from the dead and see them honored and will fall at their feet to beg for forgiveness and mercy, and they will acknowledge Jesus as Lord. 
Jesus here is tapping into a prophecy that the Jews would understand. It was a prophecy from Isaiah 60 verse 14 where Isaiah writes, The sons of your oppressors will come bowing before you. All who despise you will bow down at your feet. Now for Isaiah, the Gentiles would be bowing down to the Jews. But Jesus reverses this and turns the tables over for Philadelphia. Now, instead of Gentiles kneeling at Jewish feet, the ungodly Jews will bow before these Christians, not to worship them, but to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. One day, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and declare that He is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Second, Jesus will protect us from God's wrath. At the end of time, the most terrible trouble that has ever been known will come on the world. Scripture calls it the Great Tribulation. This is a season of God's wrath, and scholars are all over the place on when this tribulation happens and all of that. But here's here's just the basic nut of it. This pastor and his church, and by extension all faithful believers, will be protected from God's wrath. Jesus does not promise immunity for Christians from trial or persecution in general. All you got to do is look at history and look around the world today. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean it's always sunshine and daisies. There are troubles. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus doesn't promise immunity. However, Christians are protected from trial that is aimed at the rebellious namely God's wrath. Just as the plagues of Egypt only fell on Egypt and not on the Hebrews, though the Hebrews had to endure some some, uh, troubles because of it, so God's wrath will not fall on unbelievers, though we may still endure some hardships because of it. This promise reminds us that we can count on Christ, faithful, protective presence, no matter what we face. Jesus will protect us from God's wrath. He will humble our enemies. And the third promise is, He's coming back. And He says, soon. Now, soon is the hallmark of this whole work, and soon is what everybody wants to know. What's the time schedule? Well, no man knows the day or the hour, so maybe we're not translating soon or understanding soon just right. Let me alleviate some time setters and date stampers and clock watchers, the word translated soon could probably better be understood to mean suddenly rather than quickly. You see, Jesus will come soon in the sense that God has all the time in the world to wait until the right moment for His return. But when He returns, it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be suddenly. It's going to become without Warning, you're not going to be able to say, oh, Jesus is coming back, let me get ready. Nope, he's here, and it's time. He is coming soon. Since Jesus is coming back, he encourages his church to hold on to the faith so that no one will take their crown of victory. You see, even though Jesus has nothing to criticize about this church, uh, they still could fail. Because no one still living in this world is immune to falling when tempted, no matter how strong you've been in the past. That's why we always have to keep our eyes on Jesus. The fourth promise is Jesus will make us strong and secure. Jesus says in verse 12, Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I'll write on him these particular names. So he's going to make us strong and secure as a pillar. A pillar is an image of permanence and stability in the New Testament. Such imagery is used to recognize those who were faithful leaders in Galatians 2, as well as a faithful church in general in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Christ's words here, using this idea of a pillar, also spoke to the history of the city of Philadelphia. Remember that earthquake that had so shaken the city that it caused the residents to live in tents and other dwellings because they didn't trust the structures of the city. Well, Jesus says, guess what, folks? I'm going to make you a strong pillar. The city that you live in may be shakable, but I will make you unshakable, and I will place you in the temple of God. 
When these seven letters were written, that earthquake was still on people's mind. The memories of it were still there. But this promise says, I've got you. You are unmovable. And so as believers look to eternity, we can know that we will be pillars in the temple of God, meaning that we will be worshiping around His throne, but it will also mean we cannot be moved. God will never cast us from His presence. Jesus will make us strong and secure. The fifth promise is Jesus will give us a new name. He says, I will write on him the name of my God in the second part of verse 12, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. When a child is adopted by a family, he's granted a new name by the court that can never be taken away. I love that moment when an adoption takes place in a courtroom and that new name is granted. A new name indicates a new identity. This promise also had historical roots in the mind of the Philadelphians. They would appreciate references to a new name because the city had been renamed twice in its history. Though it was named Philadelphia, after that dramatic earthquake, it was renamed Neo Caesarea as a sign of gratitude to Tiberius' help in rebuilding after the earthquake. And then later on, uh, it was renamed Flavia after the family name of the Emperor Vespasian. Though none of those stuck, the name of Philadelphia stuck. Well, Jesus says that his faithful followers will be given a new name that sticks. And it will be a meaningful name. It won't be changing a name from Aunt Jemima to Pearl Milling Company. It will be a name that is significant. A name unlike changing Twitter to X. It will be a name that means something and a name that sticks for all eternity. And even better, it's a multifaceted name. Notice, he says it will be God's name, and that will signify that they belonged to God. Also, they will have the name of the new Jerusalem. That would assure their citizenship in Christ's eternal kingdom. And then he says, I'll also give them a new name, my name, which is one Jesus alone gives to a believer and knows. What a powerful thing. You have God's name, you have a city, a dwelling, and you have a new name of your new identity in Christ. These five promises reminded us or remind us that there are good things in store for people and for churches who are faithful, churches and people who know their purpose, who seize their opportunities, and who reach their potential. And when God opens a door, they walk through it. So the question that we need to always be asking are what doors are Jesus opening for us today? And I have at least two that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. The first is Harvest Day that's coming November 12th. Brandon DiGilormo will be here at the Pineville campus preaching the gospel. It'll be a great time to invite lost friends to be here to hear the gospel and to respond to the gospel message. And that caricature of him is exactly what he looks like. Long beard, bald head, big glasses. It'll be different. But sometimes we need to hear the same truths in a different way from a different messenger. And that's what I'm praying for that day. And then on the, on the 19th, we'll follow that with a baptism Sunday. We've done that a few times in the past here. On that day, the message will be earlier in the service. I'll preach on the need for baptism, the need to, to follow Christ in obedience to baptism. And then we'll be giving people an opportunity that day to be baptized. Uh, we have lots of change in area here. We'll have all the stuff that you need to uh, be baptized that day if you make that decision. And uh, it'll be a powerful day. But those two days will only be effective if we walk through the door and we invite our lost friends and we invite people to be here who need to hear that. But then the question comes down, not only are what open doors for our church, but what open doors are there for you personally? Is there a door that the Lord is opening for you that scares you? Maybe he's wanting you to step out in a certain ministry or to lead a, a Sunday school class or to tell a friend about Jesus or to make a job change. When Jesus opens a door, walk through. 
No matter how scary, no matter the challenges, no matter the strength you lack, obedience is always right. And even better, immediate obedience is always best. So obey. Know your purpose. Seize the opportunities. And reach your potential. God has a way of doing that for us. And he wants to do that in you and in me and in our church. And so as every letter ends, the challenge comes now home to us where he says, let the one who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and that includes us.